In the spring of 1940, as Nazi panzers rolled through France and the Luftwaffe terrorized Europe's skies, a 45-year-old engineer named Edgar Schmoord sat in a cramped North American aviation office in Englewood, California, sketching what would become the most important fighter plane of World War II, the P-51 Mustang. The twist was that nobody had asked him to design it. The U.S. Army Air Corps hadn't issued a contract or even hinted at wanting a new fighter. Schmood was operating purely on calculated risk. If he failed, his company would absorb the cost and his career would be over. Born in Hagen, Germany in 1899, Schmood grew up mesmerized by early aviation pioneers like the Wright brothers. After World War I, he worked for Fokker in Holland, the same company that built the Red Baron's triplane, before immigrating to America in 1930, with nothing but engineering blueprints and ambition. By 1936, he joined North American Aviation, a modest California firm known mostly for training planes, not combat aircraft. They weren't Boeing or Lockheed, they were underdogs. Then, in April 1940, the desperate British Purchasing Commission approached North American Aviation. Britain was losing aircraft faster than they could be built, and needed fighters immediately, asking North American to produce P-40 Warhawks under license. But company president James Dutch Kindleberger and Schmuid saw an opportunity. Instead of building someone else's fighter, they could design a better one from scratch. Schmuid boldly told the British they could deliver a superior fighter in 120 days, a claim so audacious it seemed delusional. Aircraft design took years, not months. Yet Schmuid had been secretly experimenting with designs that solved a critical issue plaguing all fighters of the era. Limited range. The Spitfire was brilliant in a dogfight, but short-legged. The P-40 could fly farther, but climbed poorly. The German BF-109 was lethal, but short-ranged. Schmuid believed he could bend the laws of physics with the right wing design. Against all odds, the British signed a contract on May 29, 1940 granting North American 120 days to produce a prototype. Schmued assembled 150 engineers who worked in 24-hour shifts. His secret weapon was research from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, which had developed a new laminar flow airfoil that reduced drag dramatically. On October 26, 1940, test pilot Vance Breeze took off in the first prototype, the NA-73X. It flew beautifully, light, stable, and fast. The British dubbed it the Mustang. But its brilliance had limits. When Royal Air Force pilots began flying it in 1942, they discovered that while the Mustang excelled at low altitude, its Allison V-1710 engine suffocated above 15,000 feet, rendering it useless in high-altitude combat against German fighters. The culprit was the engine's single-stage supercharger, which couldn't compress enough air in thin upper atmosphere conditions. Schmood's masterpiece had the airframe of a champion, but the lungs of a runner who couldn't breathe. Then came salvation from an unexpected source, British test pilot Ronald Harker of Rolls-Royce. After flying the Mustang, he instantly recognized the airframe's potential and wired headquarters a now legendary message. Mustang needs Merlin engine. The Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which powered Spitfires and Lancasters, featured a two-stage, two-speed supercharger that maintained full power even at 30,000 feet. Without waiting for American approval, Rolls-Royce fitted a Mustang with a Merlin 61 engine in October 1942. The results were revolutionary. Test pilot Ronnie Shepard reported astonishing speed, climb, and high-altitude performance. When American engineers tested their own version, the XP-51B, they found that the same airframe that once struggled at 15,000 feet could now fight at 35,000, climb like a homesick angel, and outrun almost anything in the sky. Packard Motor Company began mass-producing Merlins under license in Detroit, and by early 1943, the new Merlin-powered Mustangs rolled off assembly lines. But the Mustang's genius wasn't just in its engine. It was in its wings. 
Schmood's laminar flow design delayed the transition from smooth airflow to turbulent flow across the wing's surface, slashing drag by nearly 40%. It was revolutionary, but required manufacturing tolerances unheard of for wartime production. Perfectly flush rivets, mirror smooth paint, and wings polished to within thousandths of an inch. North American's engineers achieved this through painstaking craftsmanship, producing the most aerodynamically efficient wing of the war. The payoff was range. With internal and external fuel tanks, the P-51's combat radius stretched to 750 miles, double that of most Allied fighters. For the first time, a fighter could escort bombers deep into Germany and bring them home. That capability was put to the test on March 4, 1944, when 64 P-51B Mustangs escorted B-17 bombers all the way to Berlin. Luftwaffe pilots were stunned to see American fighters so deep over the Reich. The Mustangs engaged Messerschmitts and Focke-Wulfs in furious dogfights, their combination of speed, climb rate, and stability proving unstoppable. For the first time, bombers reached Berlin with full escort, and Hermann Göring, the Luftwaffe commander, reportedly admitted, When I saw Mustangs over Berlin, I knew the war was lost. From there, the Mustang became the Allies' strategic weapon. Its 650 caliber Browning machine guns shredded enemy fighters and ground targets alike. It could dive past 500 Mipoliterms without structural failure and turn tighter and climb faster than its German counterparts. Rookie American pilots, flying a plane that forgave mistakes and magnified strengths, began outmatching veteran German aces. Between January 1944 and May 1945, P-51s destroyed more than 4,900 enemy aircraft in the air and hundreds more on the ground. More importantly, they cut bomber losses from 20% per mission to under 2%, breaking the Luftwaffe's back. The Mustang didn't just win dogfights, it won the air war. After the war, the P-51 should have faded into history. But the Korean War revived it. Renamed the F-51, Mustangs flew over 60,000 combat sorties as ground attack aircraft, proving they were as tough and adaptable as ever. They served in foreign air forces for decades, Israel, Sweden, South Africa, and even the Dominican Republic, which operated them until 1984. Schmood himself went on to design the F-86 Sabre, the jet that dominated Korea and inherited much of the Mustang's DNA. Its sleek lines, aerodynamic efficiency, and pilot-focused design. The P-51's laminar flow wing also shaped the future of flight. The same principles Schmood proved in combat evolved into supercritical wing designs used in modern airliners like the Boeing 737 and Airbus A320, enabling the fuel-efficient long-range travel we take for granted today. Edgar Schmood, the German immigrant nobody asked to build a fighter, had changed aviation forever. His Mustang proved that innovation doesn't always come from orders or committees. It comes from vision, courage, and the refusal to accept limits. When his aircraft escorted bombers over Berlin, it didn't just signal the fall of Nazi Germany. It marked the triumph of one man's impossible dream drawn in pencil on a California desk in the spring of 1940.